connections between science and practice um, for agroforestry and perennial agriculture. During each of these conversations, the panelists representing both on farm and in lab spaces will meet here, exchange questions, and engage in a dialogue with us all. So I hope you're all healthy and well wherever you're joining us from um, and ready to share this space for community building and learning. And feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box so we know who's with us. My name is Hannah Hemmelgarn. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator at the Center for Agroforestry at MU. And as you saw in the chat box, if you see that, Katie Adams is also co-hosting with us. She's waving there. She is the Illinois Demonstration Farm Manager at the Savannah Institute, and she'll be helping to coordinate the audience questions and providing any technical assistance that we need along the way. So thank you, Katie. She and I are gonna be swapping roles throughout this season. Before we start, we'd like to recognize the ancestral stewards of these lands. Because we are all from unique geographic locations, we invite you to open the native land map that we'll link in the chat. And enter your location, take a moment to acknowledge the communities deeply connected to the unceded land where you live. Know that this map is not perfect, it is eternally incomplete and may leave out or misrepresent the fullness of indigenous peoples and their histories. Though many of these native nations were forcefully removed from their traditional territory, these lands continue to carry the stories of these diverse peoples and their struggles for survival and identity. As agroforesters, we feel we have an obligation and a responsibility to recognize, elevate, and support indigenous peoples and publicly acknowledge their foundational contributions to the practices and spaces where we work and live. I myself am on the land of the Osage, Wajaje, and the Oto and Missouriya, the Jiweri and Nutachi, among many other descendants of the Degihasuan tribes. Tonight, for our first nutshell conversation, we are so honored, and I am really looking forward to this, um, to have Dr. Mayan Kreitzman from the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. Um, Mayan's re PhD research on perennial agroecosystems involved our farmer guests, Dr. Claire Hintz of Elsewhere Farm and Will Crombie of Organic Compound Farm. Mayan will share about her research for the first half hour and she and then she and our farm guests <clears throat> will take some time to dialogue and share about their respective operations before we open the conversation to your questions. But please feel free to post your questions in the chat at any time. Katie will be there um, checking them and making sure we don't miss any. Also know that everyone will be muted for the entirety of the nutshell so we can maintain the best sound quality possible. So Mayan, when you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and get started. Cool, thank you so much for that introduction, Hannah. Um, are, are folks able to see? We're not seeing the presenter, or we're not seeing the presentation view. Oh, there we go. Perfect, thanks. Okay. So this, this talk is based on a chapter of my PhD, which I just finished. Um, it's kind of the social science chapter of my PhD, and it's called Local Knowledge and Relational Values of Midwestern Perennial Polyculture Farmers. Uh, and it's based on field work that I conducted in the summer of 2018, um, where I visited 14 farms, which included uh, Claire and Will's farms in the US Midwest. I, I just want to acknowledge that this is um, this is a PhD chapter, but it's also a, a co-authored paper that's in prep, and the co-authors are Dr. Molly Chapman, Keith Keeley, and Dr. Kai Chan, my supervisors. Um, and yeah, I do want to acknowledge I'm here on the unceded land of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam First Nations, um, who are still here and li living here on, uh, in what we now call Vancouver. Uh, on unceded territory. So thanks for inviting everybody to do that, um, Hannah. So um, this this chapter of my PhD was sort of the social science portion of work that was mainly focused on biophysical aspects of, of transition to perennial agriculture in the Midwest. Um, and in this and in this um, 
part of the work, I interviewed the farmers that I visited to find out how these perennial polyculture enterprises are working from the perspective of farmers. So over from the perspective of farmer livelihoods, the motivations, the actual management knowledge, um, the community, the challenges and barriers that people were facing, um, and the values of these, these um, unique farmers. Um, so I visited 14 farms um, in the Midwest. Just for privacy, we're not going to pinpoint exactly where they are, but this is the general geography. And as many of you know better than I do, most probably, this is the heart of the U.S. Corn Belt. Um, and the agriculture typical of this area is high input corn soybean rotation and cattle, as well as an increasing um, concentration of CAFO um, animal feed operations in, in three of the four states that we visited. Um, in the pre-colonial uh, U.S. Midwest, an important ecosystem was the oak savanna, which is sort of a mixed grassland woodland ecosystem which is in some ways ecologically mimicked by some of the perennial polycultures that that I visited. Um, so I conducted 13 interviews uh, with 18 participants total um, and I also filled out a questionnaire with the farmers uh, to ask about the, the ways they, they were using their land, their income on and off the farm, and their production and yields from, from their um, perennial enterprises. And these were coded with uh, interview coding software in vivo with, with a mixture of predefined themes and themes that also emerged from the conversations that, um, that I had. Um, this is just, uh, uh, these are some photos of the, of the places that I, I visited. That's my field assistant, Noah, there carrying um, some gear. And on, in the top row, there's examples of the perennial fields that, that we visited on these perennial polyculture uh, enterprises with the sort of annual conventional crops that were next door that, that served as a comparison for, for the biophysical part of this, this work, which I won't be presenting today. Um, but the perennial plantings generally consisted of a canopy layer of fruit or nuts, um, like chestnuts, apples, pears, plums, cherries, um, and then a shrub layer of aronia, black currant, elderberry, other kinds of berries, and then uh, a pasture, like an understory layer with either a pasture mix or hay that was either um, that was either mowed and left in place or mowed and baled or grazed, depending on the situation. And um, yeah, there were a variety of different management. Um, practices in terms of the, the, the extent of layering that was going on or how complex or simplified the, the, um, the space actually was. But the minimum criteria for being included in the study was that these enterprises were a polyculture, so they were um, growing more than one kind of perennial crop for harvest and that they were on a commercial scale. So they were, they were selling or intending to sell what they were producing. Um, and that's in contrast to a lot of the more um, the smaller or garden scale permaculture type um, operations that many of us are probably familiar from, like from a demonstration farm point of view. Um, so a, a lot of these farms weren't even producing yet because they were quite young, um, but the intention was that they would be on a commercial scale. Um, just some background on the, on the farmers and farms that I visited. Um, seven of the people were men, uh, sorry, seven were women, 11 were men. Um, you can see the age range here. Um, most of the land that people were using to farm was purchased by, by, the, purchased by themselves. Um, uh, some of it was inherited or inherited in part, and a few of the properties were uh, rented. And um, and actually, the ones that were rented were were also owned together with business partners and managed uh, with business partners and employees. So that was an interesting connection. That the the, the farms that were renting their land um, were also um, getting some capital investment from other people. 
Um, in terms of land use on farms, you can see um, in, oh, let me just move this so I can actually see. Oh yeah, so in, in blue is the, the land in, perennial, in the perennial enterprises on the 14 farms, and in orange is other land uses on those farms. So you can see there's a broad range of sizes of farms from just under one acre to around like 450 acres. Um, and, and for most of the farms, they weren't using a huge amount of their total property for the perennial enterprises, but some of the farms certainly were using a lot or most of the property for the perennial enterprises. And the remaining land on farms was planted into um, different kinds of things, um, whether it was in some cases row crops like corn and soy, um, or, or pasture, or timber, or vegetable, and a variety of, of different uses. As far as income goes, um, this is for the year 2017, which was the year before I visited the farmers, so they reported to me their income from the previous season. Um, you can see that um, the gross income from perennial enterprises was was pretty small, um, but just note that, like I mentioned, a lot of these farms were young in terms of their plantings, and so they were expected to be bearing more or starting to bear, and so the, that, that income from the perennial enterprises was expected to increase. But in all cases, people had other sources of income, um, and um, and the perennial enterprises needed to be part of a mix of other livelihood sources. Um, for, for some people, the enterprises were were really important financially, and their success was very important financially, and for other people it wasn't. So I'll just read out these quotes. Um, so one farmer said, I mean, we're mostly trying to be a commercially successful farm, and I think that's our primary motivation. It doesn't constitute a huge portion of our income right now, but we'd like to get to where it does. I think we'd like to get there because we want that. We want to be farmers. And then another uh, participant had uh, said this. I think our position has been, we brought the idea here. That's that now it's up to the next generation or the next people who want to maybe expand on this. From an economic standpoint for us, we're in a position where we don't need that income. So you can see that there's a variety of different um, points of view from the, the perspective of, for some people, yes, the, the income coming from these enterprises is important and is projected to be even more important and they want that. Uh, and for other people, they might be selling things commercially, but it's it's not really a huge, it doesn't need to be a huge part of their livelihood. Um, people also saw these enterprises uh, as being tied to rural livelihoods more broadly. So noting that the, if they could create a successful business um, in their community, it would counteract depopulation and um, sort of brain drain, et cetera, that the rural Midwest um, is experiencing. Um, Motivations for the perennial uh, polyculture enterprises, um, I just rank them here in terms of the ones that came up most often. The, the most universal one was to experiment, innovate, and educate. And that one came up with every farmer that I talked to um, who spoke about, in some way, scaling up through knowledge um, and being an example or being um, a resource for other people. Other, others were interested in creating healthy environments and healthy food was big, um, livelihood, successful, profitable business, um, to be in harmony or restore nature, to grow food for their own household. That was one that came up about half the time, um, to establish markets and industries, so scaling up um, through markets, uh, to provide land access to the next generation of farmers came up a bit, and sharing foods um, and sort of flavors was one that came up as well. Um, I'll just I'll just quote read out a couple quotes around motivations. Uh, someone said, "Well, one is make money, two is sequester carbon, and then three would be to inspire others to do the same because numbers one and two work." So that's a very concise little summary of saying, "Yeah, we have these specific goals, but we're also wanting to scale that up through education and example setting." about what these systems could look like on a bigger scale. Um, the second quote is, 
My personal main objective is to create a better lifestyle for the public in general. My motto is, you know, get your wealth or health from the farm, not the pharmacy. So that's why we're really concentrating on perennial crops, because you have a nutritional value there. Field crops produce a lot of caloric input, but we're concerned about health and well-being. And that quote highlights really the idea that a lot of these farmers didn't really have a goal of like feeding vast amounts of people. It was more about quality of food and the nutritional density of the food that they were producing on a local um, scale. So I think that um, th that quote relates to the sort of different narrative that these farmers have as far as sustaining other people goes. Um, as far as management, um, there were definite trade-offs in balancing efficiency with uh, diversity, both on a spatial and temporal scale that were expressed by a number of the farmers. Um, and this is a short presentation, so there's so many things about management that I learned, um, but I'm just gonna read this quote, which I think encapsulates some of that complexity. Um, the farmer said, and here it was very hard to move the pigs around because we have berries and pears and because we have early and late season stuff together. It's hard to do. I feel like we could do a mix of just woody perennial things and then just not have animals. There are some things I'd like to try to do if I wasn't thinking about getting animals in there. I feel like eventually, once the trees are fully grown, it's going to be easier to integrate animals in there. I don't want to do it when they're young because they can do a lot of damage, but I feel like it's potentially eliminating some tractor use and doing more to help with pest and disease pressure rather than just spraying, you know. So this farmer is basically expressing that they want to have animals in their, in their perennial polyculture because they think it's eliminating tractor use and some, providing some benefits to the system. But there's also some complexity there in terms of when can the animals be there for harvest dates from a food safety perspective and from a maturation perspective of the trees in terms of damage. Um, so this, so the, the, design, the, the design for diversity that the farmers are doing um, is, is sort of limited or mediated by some trade-offs in terms of the complexity, especially when there's animals involved. Um, and that's over the short term in terms of what needs to be harvested when and the food safety rules and over the long term in terms of maturation and succession within the systems. Um, the farmers also talked about an intentional lack of management, um, which is kind of interesting. I, oh yeah, here's a quote about that. Um, so this person says, and quite honestly, weeding the trees is one of the most useful, useless expenditures of time I can imagine, because they're all old enough to hold their own against the weeds that are, that are there right now, I think, because they have been heavily mulched. As long as we can keep the hay down and the trees can get sunshine, as long as we get enough rain, then they'll get two out of the three things that they need. Um, and this isn't to say that nobody weeded their trees, it's just that there was this idea that, to some extent, perennials need to hold their own and they're not going to be micromanaged and maximally managed at all times. And that's kind of different than what a lot of uh, literature says about farmers' attitudes towards having a sort of neat and tidy aesthetic on their farms that's very uh, managed. So that was kind of an interesting feature of some of the farmers. Uh, there was also a lot around experimentation, learning, and adaptation. Um, so this is one quote from somebody that said, I have enterprises that I've created after observing what's best on the land here. I'm not coming in with a vision that I'm wedded to that has to happen on this land no matter what, I guess is what I'm saying. So I really want to learn from the landscape, from what the landscape is teaching me, which is you can't really have tractors here. You know, you can have them for mowing or doing some yard work or something, but it's not going to work for agriculture, for tillage and weed management. So this farmer was noting that they had learned from over the years on their farm that because of the waterlogging flooding issues they'd experienced, they can't really use tractors there. And so that's why they moved into a more perennial based uh, approach to their farm. But this learning and adaptation was sort of part of the adaptive management approaches that many of the farmers were implementing, which ex included experimentation and change. In terms of community relationships, in the interviews, a bunch of organizations that I'm sure many of us are familiar with 
um, came up in those conversations. Um, and there were also, people were also familiar with each other. So different people came up um, as mentors. So five of the people like within the study came up from other people in the study uh, as people that were teachers are important to them. And so these connections, these horizontal connections, which weren't necessarily in people's local neighborhoods um, were really important as we know. Um, and that was contrasted to sometimes a more ambivalent relationship with the immediate neighborhood. Um, it, it wasn't black or white or anything like that, but, um, but a number of farmers expressed a sort of ambivalence about their immediate neighborhood. Some, so this is one quote um, about one of the farmers that visited a neighbor to just uh, buy some seed or something like that. And the farmer said, he said to me, I just want you to know that I really admire what you guys are doing. That was nice to hear. I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but I feel like people think that we're just like freaky weirdos. So having that validation from my neighbor was nice. And so here, obviously, the farmer was, was kind of emotional about this moment because it was so unusual to get that acknowledgement from their neighbors about the things that they were doing differently in that neighborhood. Another farmer shared with me that like the people in the neighboring town don't know anything about their farm or um, that if they, another farmer said, if they say that they're farming, people assume that they have a dairy farm. And so there's a sense of feeling invisible or not, yeah, not feeling as visible um, with the neighborhood. Um, even people that are very engaged, like within um, some of the organizations that I listed earlier. In terms of challenges um, and barriers to expansion or barriers to thriving, um, the management challenges that I mentioned earlier around managing complexity, those were, those definitely were challenges, but they weren't usually presented as barriers. People were, people embraced the biophysical challenges of management quite a bit and were um, happy to, they, they didn't seem to have deep regrets about um, different mistakes that they'd made around management. Um, the things that came up more more so as barriers were um, kind of more financial and structural issues around mid, uh, accessing markets, uh, processing capacity, um, financial support or capacity around insurance or bank loans and, and stuff like that. Um, so I'll just read out this quote um, from one of the farmers who said, we can establish a hundred acres of some perennial crop, but it's not going to mature and produce a full yield for, you know, five to seven to 10 years. And there's really not financing systems that are even set up to think about that. And there are some starting to develop out there in the world, but you can't go to a conventional bake and tell them you're going to plant hazelnuts and say we'll have a yield in six years. And we can't pay you back for six years. You just can't do that in a conventional financing system. So some of the, a lot of the barriers were around those kinds of things of access to capital um, and insurance, and not so much about the actual on-farm management. Um, and when I did a little policy analysis, um, I realized that a lot of the programs that people have access to in terms of financial support for environmental practices on their farms, et cetera, aren't really geared towards perennial agriculture. Um, the CRP program and different riparian buffer programs that will do contracts with people for beneficial management practices on their farms are predicated on taking land out of production rather than producing uh, food while while generating those same ecosystem services at the same time. And I have a more detailed list of and kind of analysis of those that people want, but I just skipped it here because it's a little much. Um, to sort of summarize through the different topic areas that, that I talked to the farmers about, um, I did an analysis through the lens of relational values. And these relational values are basically, um, they're basically um, statements of value that, that, um, that are about people's principles, virtues, and preferences, or even obligations. Um, in 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 their relationships. So here in this um, in this illustration, you can see the blue 
there's these yellow arrow, arrows sort of represent relationships between different uh, components, whether it's the farmer and their farm and landscape or the farmer and their community. And these relationships anchor different relational values that came out in all the different parts of the interviews. Um, so the value of self-sustenance, of stewardship and care of farmland, of connection to nature and wildlife, um, the relationship between people and community anchored the value of other, other sustenance or sustaining others in a bigger community. Um, and both of those relationships really anchored the, the themes of eudaimonia, which is, which is basically um, sort of like notions of a good life, um, diversity, and that diversity appeared both from a biological physical point of view and both from a and from a financial point of view long-term thinking so thinking about um, people's own life cycles as well as the life cycles of their perennial plants and learning and sharing which came up um, all the time in all the different areas um, and so I'll just read a few quotes from from these different areas of value around stewardship and care of farmland um, and self-sustenance um, somebody said, I think our ability to use our land to grow food, to sell, is to grow our business is really based on the health of the land. And I think about erosion is a really good example. Erosion is something that with the landscape of he around here we see on a lot of farms, and we basically don't see on our farm. A little bit on the side of the driveway, but I think that erosion washes away topsoil. It washes away organic material and everything you've spent time building and it washes the way the economic potential of your land too, if you're thinking about it that way. So here we can see that the, the value of sustaining yourself off your land and stewarding the land um, kind of are all mixed together. Um, in terms of learning and sharing, somebody said, I think one of the things I'm grateful for in this way of farming is that we get to ask more creative questions than like, what antibiotic should I give this cow that's standing in three feet of shit? Like, why does it keep getting sick, you know? And so this person was talking about how they, the kinds of questions and investigations that they get to do are more interesting to them in this kind of system. And then around connection to identity and a good life for farmers and what that looks like, um, this farmer said, but all in all, farming teaches you how to be. It really does. You have to have a real strong self-awareness and a sort of keen observation of the land and what it's telling you and how to best intervene. So that's my view or my view right now. You know, it's taxing, it can be isolating. You're never really alone, but at the same time you're alone. It's sort of a weird thing, but anyway, I guess to me it's sacred. Um, so these quotations are just examples of the way that people's values appeared in these interviews and um, and we can see that these relational values are fulfilled in a variety of ways that layers people's livelihood needs as well as the principles, preferences, and virtues and obligations that, that they're fulfilling in this way of life. So just to conclude here around the questions that I started out with. Um, so. In 2017, it was providing a minor piece of income for the farmers that I talked to, but growing in some cases. Um, in terms of motivations, experimentation, innovation, and education was a universal motivation, and there were a variety of different ones as well. Um, for management knowledge, people were implementing adaptive management um, and sort of learning and experimenting with the different trade-offs in complexity on their on their in their management um, schemes um, for community relationships there were strong non-local horizontal connections that were really important for people um, and management challenges were distinctive from more systemic or financial barriers for people to extend for people to succeed and expand um, and the values that people expressed manifested in all the different um, subject areas that we talked about um, and, and were anchored in, in these relationships. Um, in terms of takeaways or like more, I don't know, 
policy-oriented, program-oriented recommendations that come out of this work. Um, I came up with a few for, for the conclusions of my PhD, and, and I just thought I'd share them here. One is around payments for ecosystem services programs, um, around compensating and rewarding farmers um, without restricting harvest um, for the ecosystem services their farms are providing, which are often the same as set aside or better quality than set aside um, programs that people get paid for. Um, up, having programs that do upfront investments and cost share um, is really is really useful as as opposed to just insurance or if something goes wrong um, kinds of financial support. Um, food safety regulations. I know that's something that the Savannah Institute and others have, have started to talk about extensively around easing or managing the restrictive food safety regulations that make the integration of animals difficult in tree crop systems. Um, applied research, so just having more more sort of ready to implement systems that that people can get familiar with and learning from farmers about what those are. Um, processing and market development, um, regional marketing infrastructure, whether cooperative or privately owned for perennial crops. Um, bridging organizations, I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to <laughs> say anything more about that, just considering where we are today, but hugely, hugely important um, to have those connections for farmers um, between research and each other. And, and just on the structural level, and a more even playing field, and that was highlighted by many farmers around barriers that more than having programs that are tailored for them, what's important is not having programs that are tipping the balance so um, so decisively in favor of unsustainable and conventional um, practices. Um, and that's about it for me for, for this presentation. I have some extra slides that I put in the back, um, but I'll just refer to those if we need to. Um, but for this discussion, I mean, I'm, yeah, I, We've got Claire Hintz and Will Crombie, who are two of the amazing farmers that I visited, and I'm really interested in their reflections on this work. And um, I put a few discussion questions up here, but we can really reflect on anything. And um, in some ways, I feel a little, just to start things off, I feel a bit awkward because I think a lot of the things that have come out of this study are kind of like, yeah, no duh for this community. It's it's um it might it might not but I still am interested and yet like in the scientific literature there still isn't a reflection of what this community is doing yet. Um and so in some ways it's geared towards that, but I am interested in in hearing if this if the findings do resonate with you or don't resonate or how this could be useful um, within the perennial agriculture community, um, if it can be. So I'll just open it up from there. Hey, I can uh, jump in. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Claire Hintz, and my farm, uh, I will disclose, is up in northern Wisconsin on Lake Superior. Um, we had a three month growing season this year with a last hard freeze in, on June 15th and the first hard freeze on September 15th, almost exactly. And so um, I felt very vindicated by my perennial systems <laughs> this year because they're a whole lot more resilient than my vegetable production. Um, but um, I, I Lo uh, it was really interesting to have this presentation, Mayan, um, and and sort of get the bigger picture in which I am embedded. And I do feel like it's very consistent. Every all the conclusions you've drawn so far are very consistent with my experience. Um, and it's nice to sort of get a bigger context of the stuff that I'm working on and struggling with, and um, you know, developing over time and. Um, uh, it, it's affirming to hear from other people's experiences about um, what, you know, barriers they're running into or the, the long-term implications. And um, 
I, I really love um, the values portion of the discussion um, because it, I feel like it really echoes something that I learned from my own dissertation work with women farmers in Wisconsin and Minnesota, which is that the values really drive us even when the going gets tough. And um, I was looking for persistent strategies with women farmers and I thought I would find like good business skills or extra financial backing or, you know, hard, hard aspects like that. And it turned out to be um, in some ways a lesson in the liberal arts because it was, it was the values that really drove everybody um, to persist for more, you know, more than a decade in, in, in farming in sustainable agriculture. So um, uh, I just want to throw out in terms of sharing and networking, um, I am working actively right now with um, Farm Commons um, around a um, project to look at uh, food safety regulations and perennial agriculture and uh, integrated livestock. And um, Maya, and since you were here on the farm, I have added some fencing and organized some, a couple more things. And I feel like it's working pretty well now, um, even with, um, I'm, I'm more restrictive than the food safety regulations because I'm following organic standards. Um, those are also, I, I would love if they were updated um, to reflect real science around manure management. But um, in the meantime, I'm following those standards. So, um, but I, I feel like it can work even within that kind of restrictive uh, framework um, with, with a significant amount of management and forethought. Um, so uh, I'll just leave it there. And um, I'm, I'm really excited for this presentation. It's really great to see the culmination of all the work that you put into it. And um, certainly I benefited from having you and your team out on the, on the farm because it gave me um, some things to notice and some things that, uh, some baseline, uh, information that I didn't have before um, to be able to take forward and, and make sure that I'm that changes I'm making are, are um, actually having an impact. So yeah, this is great. I appreciate it. Mm. Thank you, Claire. I, yeah, I, it's good to, I'm also interested in Will, what you thought about the value section, because I was a little hesitating. It seems to um, talk about that because I guess it's, it seems a little more academic or something like that. But the fact that it resonates um, is is really cool because I think um, what other literature has also shown is that um, if you design payments for ecosystem services programs that are just purely monetary and don't speak to people's values properly or don't acknowledge the reasons why people are doing things, um, that can be damaging and it doesn't always work very well. So um, acknowledging the the people's values and and what's important to them can even be important for program development um, and making sure that programs are effective in resonating with the reasons why people are doing it, not just throwing money at them necessarily. Um, Will, did you have any reflections? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that you pulled that, the motivation element into it because it's like, how are we going to inspire others to do this work if that's what we're all so passionate about is one of our main anchors for the reasons why we do this work? Well, then we need to understand what are our, our own motivations and then how can we describe that to others? Like I even took a screenshot of, of that, that slide. I don't know if you want to go back to it, but oh sure. <clears throat> it's like right there. It's like to, to experiment innovate and educate, to create healthy environments and grow healthy food, to have a successful, profitable business, to restore or be in harmony with nature. It's like, do you want to do that in your life? Because this is how it's possible. Mm. So I think that the, the data that you took on all of our farms, the cross comparisons and, and just getting people to understand like, you know, you included the pH of the soil in there. Well, that tells you that you're, you know, what potential crops might enjoy that or the, you know, the soil types, like all of that is so important for people to understand before they go into taking over their farm. So I think it's absolutely crucial and, and sharing that data from our perspective as farmers, if this is where we started, this is where we brought it to, these are why we chose those plants. 
and then speaking to people and their motivations is what's going to get us to grow this this movement of perennial farming what do you think of the idea of like so these are in this study i visited people that were like already doing these practices and mm -hmm. very committed to it and that did when i was reviewing the literature it contrasted pretty strongly to a lot of literature around agroforestry which is which surveys or interviews people about why they're not doing it or what or people that haven't done it about why they're not doing it um mm -hmm. and and it sort of brought to mind this question of like yes if this movement is going to grow and scale up what's like thinking about the, the different stages in people's journeys towards adoption and con and and continuing like this study is sort of more focused on people that yeah it's focused on people that have already adopted these practices and are trying to continue um versus other studies that look at sort of people earlier in the journey or that aren't going to start the journey and i was just wondering what you thought about that or like do you think these motivations are unique to the strange and wonderful small group of people that have already adopted these practices or that they could maybe resonate with a larger group of people if the goal is scaling up and growing this movement well i think that yeah you i mean you identified the barriers as well and to a lot of farmers the barriers are what's holding them back the access to financing the access to land or you know just being in the in the the conventional model in that system and not understanding how to get into something like this is it's just as imp important as the motivation there's there's like two there's many sectors of people who are going to be interested in this and i think um there is a whole group of people that will will resonate with these motivations and then there's a whole group of people that just want to know what equipment do I need to get and where can I get a loan and who's going to teach me how to do it? So I think all of it is important. Claire, did you have anything to put in on that? Yeah, I, I, I was really struck. Um, well, a couple of things. I was really struck that the values that you highlighted, Mayan, um, really resonate with me, with my other hat of just a plain organic farmer. And, um, and so I think um, it, it, one of the things your dissertation highlights is that um, there's so much common ground um, outside of perennial farming with the broader sustainable agriculture movement. And, you know, the barriers, as Will said, are real. Um, I, also th I also think that um, similar barriers exist to getting started in CSA farming, vegetable production. Um, and, you know, I mentor a lot of beginning farmers and I talk to them about the fact that they need to have a solid financial plan and they need to figure out what their creative financing is going to be. Um, we have all figured it out one way or another. And I think your, your chart of um, income streams is pretty telling that it takes a lot of investment to get these systems up and running over a long period of time you know, and, and mine's been in place for 20 years and it's just starting to kick in now financially, you know. So um, having the long view and having a real solid business plan, you know, and that's the same as any other farming enterprise. And it, it's making sure that the mentorship networks that already exist, um, so whether that's SFA or Moses or um, the Land Link program now, there's a whole bunch of programs in the Midwest to help beginning farmers and um, fairly young, experience-wise young farmers have a mentor and, you know, whether it's getting started or whether it's scaling up after the first few years of production, um, it's making sure that the perennial agriculture um, examples are out there and that those programs have all of our names <laughs> or whatever, you know, as mentors for the, for the people who are potentially uh, exploring that production system. And, I, and I'm hoping that um, in addition to all the academic publications that you create from your dissertation, you might put together, you know, in some ways sort of a more um, uh, 
pop culture or public <laughs> book or manuscript, you know, to talk about, you know, here is a set of people who are sort of past the beginning stages, but still not in necessarily in the mature business model. Maybe some of us are, but many of us are not. And um, this is a great snapshot for people who may want to get started with this and need to know more than just what tractor to buy or what the payback is on a roll of currents or, you know, whatever. Um, because there's so many nuances to um, learning from the land and, and, and um, you know, the permaculture principles are helpful, but they don't, there's a lot of applications that are at the homestead scale. So I think the space that you're occup occupying is very unique and needs a lot of filling. <laughs> I think there's a lot of space in here um, to talk about production systems, um, financially viable production systems. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, that's that's great. I'm, yeah, I would love to be able to share this in whatever format feels useful for for people in in, in this space. Um, because yeah, it's going to be published like in an academic. Um, format but i would i would love to be able to share it more widely with people that are in in this space and i'm i'm very happy to to talk to you more claire about what that could look like um yeah i think that's a really great segue into shifting to some of the questions that have been popping up in the chat and also you know i myself do participatory research um, and this, I think, is a really great example of being able to have these dialogues between researcher and the research participant um, so that you have a voice in what, what value comes from the research for you. Um, so often we think, you know, I mean, I think, Mayan, your, your research serves both of these worlds. The, re the research community needs to know what's happening on farm, and um, these farmers can also be served from learning collectively as has been demonstrated here. Um, so just to jump in here, we had a question from Raylan Cronenberg. She's one of our MS agroforestry students at MU, um, asking Claire and Will how you learned about perennial agriculture and what led you to shift your practices and incorporate perennial species on your land in the first place. Uh, yeah, I could just jump right in. Um, I. In my master's program, I a part of my master's program was was permaculture design, and so I had an early motivation in the design aspect of it. I was very turned off by um, the sort of um, cult of personality going on in the permaculture movement, so I walked away from that from a, for a long time. Um, when I moved to my farm, I, I was planning a vegetable CSA and probably some orchards, but it looked a little bit more um, conventional organic. Um, I had a incident of seven inches of rain in 24 hours and I was flooded out until July and I realized at that moment that if I was going to farm where I live, which I love because it's right by Lake Superior, um, that it was going to have to dr drastically change and I was going to have to go back to my permaculture roots. And, um, and then since then it's really been learning by observation. My pigs teach me so much my turkeys teach me so much, um, and I'm just adapting systems as I watch them interact with the land, um, as I watch the plants interact with them, um, and, and that's been my best training um, since I started farming full-time. Um, yeah, so I, I have agriculture in my family, and my father's side of the family man manufactures greenhouses and my mother's side of the family is dairy and corn and soy farmers and I didn't have that connection as a young person and I basically throughout my journey of being a filmmaker and a web marketer in that space have have stumbled across the the love of telling these types of stories stories that are like eco based or social justice based and really I just found myself on a farm in Hawaii and said I need to go home and do this at home and it started with a garden and just grew into what it is today and mentors played a huge role in that and 
finding the permaculture movement played a huge role in that and just plugging into all the different facets of ways that you can work with the land and be a homesteader, be a farmer. That, that evolution is, is sort of my backstory into how I landed on this in this space of being a perennial farmer, which I don't know, five, six years ago, didn't think was possible, but other people made it possible for us to do this here on, on our land. So grateful. Related to that, that what you're talking about, Will, with access to resources and support. Um, we also had a question asking if any of the farmers that you worked with, Mayan, um, had utilized uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service or other support funds or agency resources. Yeah, I was just trying to look up um, exactly how many uh, were enrolled because I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, yes, there were there were. Um, Darn it. Maybe I can just quickly try to find it here. Yeah, people were involved in um, CRP. Um, and, okay, here we go. Um, seven, seven were in, enrolled in CRP, but that, that, that's obviously not the portion of the farm that, that's in perennial production. That's, that was usually prairie habitat. Um, or or uh, wetland um, habitat that was involved in CRP. And then there was one, only one farm that had an NRCS um, contract. Um, that, um, that actually included perennial crops. So the way that they did that was it was for a sort of buffer area that had a bunch of perennial crops, but they weren't going to harvest it for the first 10 years. And so it was under a, a contract with NRCS for those 10 years while it was maturing. And then there were uh, the, some, one other farm had also was getting a bit of money for a rotational grazing. Um, and and that was about it. So yeah, people were enrolled in these programs, but but as I mentioned, like the bulk of their perennial polycultures weren't because um, they can't be harvested at the same time. Um, but from the biophysical part of my work, we saw that those um, habitats are actually, you know, pretty biodiverse and are supporting more insects than a hayfield would typically. Um, or even yeah, so um, so it's it's inter and from for birds and stuff, it was even more than the prairie habitat than that people get that do get um, CRP payments for. Um, does that answer the question? Sorry, I was a bit scattered. I was actually trying to look. Yeah, no, I think so. And she had asked um, how those programs were helpful or challenging. Um, so I think yeah, yeah, I think they were part of the mix, but. Of, of income streams on the farm, for sure. I think they're fairly modest contributions um, to people's incomes. They don't really compare on the same scale as the kinds of um, subsidies that corn and soy farmers get, which can total up to like 60 to 80% of their income. So even though people did use government programs to an extent, um, some of them chose not to just because they didn't want to have the extra overhead even if they, of dealing with it, even if they would have qualified for it because the amounts are not um, astronomical. So getting more into the, the nuts and bolts, um, uh, we had a couple of questions um, about what, what's happening on the farms. So were the farms um, that were incorporating or wanted to incorporate animals, were they aiming to commercial, commercialize animal products or did they incorporate the animals to be part of their polycultural system? Um, they were all, I think, they were all selling the animals or animal products. So they were part of the commercial sort of mix of the things that were being produced. Um, except for two of the farms that were producing poultry on a pretty intense scale. Um, 
most of them were not producing like huge amounts of animal products. It would be like seven to 20 pigs or 15 lambs or a, a, a flock of like 80 chickens or a hundred chickens or something like that. Um, so, but, but that is still a commercial scale for these farms, right? It's part of, it's part of their income stream. And, um, and I think the benefits, the ecological or the sort of regulation benefits for doing it within the orchards is, um, it's kind of intermixed. They're not separable, um, from the, the commercial portion of, of it. I think there might have been a couple of the farms that were that just had a few animals for domestic consumption on their orchards, but I, but most of them, I think it was about half the farms that had animals that they, they were um, still being uh, sold. And then uh, another one of these practical questions: How many of the farmers you interviewed had interns or employees working on the farm? Oh, good question. I don't actually know off the top of my head. Um, I know, hmm, I don't think any of them had like interns in, in the sense of like months of free labor kind of thing. Um, I did not meet anyone that, that was sort of in that kind of a role in the season that I was there. Um, I did meet people that had employees or at least part-time employees for sure. Um, on maybe on, I'd have to count, but maybe four or five of the farms um, had employees. Um, so I think a lot of them were still sort of nuclear family based, but especially the ones that were based on business partnerships and were renting land, they were employing people or employing people outside of a nuclear family to um, work the land. Yeah, I, think, I feel like there's so much we can dive into with all of these little um, strings of topics. And I want to make sure that Will and Claire have a chance to offer any insights too. So feel free, both of you, to um, chime in with any of these questions. Um, one of the things that you brought up, Mayan, is about the visibility of the, the work that's being done and how unique it is. And um, I'm curious, especially for Claire and Will, if you have thought about what strategies for visibility would be effective, especially from the research side of things? What can we do to make sure what you're doing is, is visible and out there for, for others to learn at the very least? I think the main thing is to continue to do the research. Um, I think the Savannah Institute has a good track record and Mayan's work is, is really groundbreaking. I think it's filling a, a pretty significant void in the literature. Um, and it's, you know, continuing to publish this stuff. And, and um, I think what at least is so jazzy to me is the integrated approach that Mayan took and that um, I know the Savannah Institute is working on with the University of Wisconsin. Um, I'm up in the Northern temperate ecosystem. And so I just want to put a plug in that not everything is prairie savanna um, in terms of perennial agriculture, that, that uh, the Northern temperate ecosystem is a different system and uh, another ac whole exploration for sure. Um, but, uh, and you know, I, I think there's still a lot of room in terms of publishing uh, books. Um, you know, I certainly keep my eye on and collect a lot of um, perennial agriculture and permaculture books. Um, and s almost all of it is written at the homestead scale. Um, so, you know, just continuing to, to put these things out there. And you know, and make sure that the farms are networked, whether it's, you know, a, a webinar like this um, or um, our own Facebook or website um, things. You know, we're in a moment where digital presentations are what we're doing and, and it's really helpful to connect people who might not otherwise be able to travel um, and do these kinds of things. So 
um, yeah, but it's, it, you know, the, building a, a collection of case studies is really critical. Yeah, I have to agree with Claire there about like the long term documentation, especially in the sense of like, we live in this world of sensationalism. So we need that. Here's where we started and look what we did, you know, it, at the end of it all kind of sensationalist outlook on how we share this data and yeah, we're doing it right now in this webinar. And I think there's a lot of great points to be made in the motivational aspect and the barrier aspect that could be synthesized into many different talking points and, and shareable items and conversations. Like the conversation we're having right now, we could spin off in, in, in a lot of different directions. So there, I think there's a lot, a lot of ways that you can share this content beyond the scientific community beyond just this webinar here. It's gonna be great. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for the, the positive feedback. It really means uh, the world to me because I think that, and it's continuing like in the process of doing, the, doing research, you kind of end up feeling a bit isolated from the begin, from the thing itself and then it can feel very extractive like that you've just taken this information <laughs> And now you're gonna like analyze it and finish your PhD with it. Um, but then, so now I'm having done that. Now I'm kind of, I'm. I really want to make sure that I'm connecting back and um, and uh, and serving the community in whatever way I can, so that it's not just that extractive process. And so, um, yeah, I'm just available to to make smaller pieces or or little paragraphs or shareable things or whatever anyone thinks could be useful from this information absolutely awesome well thank you all for being part of this um this we're we're at our hour of time together so this is perfect it feels like just the beginning of a conversation that really ought to continue um so i hope that um, everyone that has been part of this webinar has a chance to um, find some people that are continuing that, that inspiration and motivation for them. Um, and, and thanks especially to Will and Claire and Mayan for, for being here. Um, Katie, do you have any final words to leave us with before we sign off? You're muted. Thanks everyone for joining us and for building this community. Um, it takes all of us farmers, researchers, practitioners, dreamers, and doers to make it happen. So we're so excited to have you all part of the extended agroforestry and perennial agricultural network. And we should say the next one of these conversations will be November 10th. Um, it's the next second Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. Central Time. Um, and that will be focused on education and training opportunities. So Katie and I will both be there again um, with some other folks and, and I hope that you all will return to join us. So you can just follow that Eventbrite registration link. So thanks everyone and we'll see you in November hopefully. Take care. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Be in touch with Yeah, be in touch well. Great, thanks so much. Oh, I've got the bird info to send you guys too. Yay. Yeah, finally. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll send that over email. Yeah. Great, great. I'll, uh, I'll get you um, some of the video from your time out here too. I had, oh, a, sweet. had a hard drive crash. So oh. it's, in, it's in the data recovery center right now. And, oh, um, no. <gasps> and get Did that. you have important stuff on there? A whole lot, yeah. Oh, like my wedding shit. and stuff like that. But it's all oh, recovered. No. It's all recovered and they're sending it back. Oh, okay. So, Phew. Yeah. Well, it's not a high priority. It's fine. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. But the birds the bird data is high priority. You better get that over to me. No, I'm just Yeah, kidding. I will. I will. <laughs> That'll be exciting. So many blue jays eating my hazelnuts. Oh shoot. I know they're on the list. <laughs> All right, we better end this call so that uh, we can let Katie work her magic, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, you guys. I'm not editing the video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, that's my, that's like an olive That's olive Michelle. Olive. Yeah. Great. All right, everybody have a good night. You too. I love to you and your family, Will. Thanks. Likewise, right back at all of you. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I thought that was fun. Yeah. It went great. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I realized I can see all the questions that are posted in the oh. chat. So I, I don't know if they